Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, be here in Greece after traveling for um, a long time and coming from the other side of, of the world. I'm representing uh, my university, which is the Australian College of Applied Psychology. And today I'd like to present you some research, two different um, studies, which are among other studies that we are presenting and uh, that we're currently running. This is the second one where we looked at um, anxiety and depression in a sample of college students. Um, the other author of the uh, presentation, the paper today, is one of my graduate students, and she was not able to attend. And um, that's it. As you already know, worry is a um, cognitive linguistic process um, where uh, people have repetitive thoughts about the future. And the thoughts, I move it through here, thank you. The thoughts are uh, thoughts of a negative nature and uh, begin with the question as if. Again, this is not new information, I'm sure for you, that uh, excessive worry is part of most anxiety disorders and in particular, in particular generalized anxiety disorder, which is a very common uh, psychological uh, disorder. Generalized anxiety, excessive worry is also present in depression, which is another probably within the two disorders, anxiety and depression, we get the majority of psychological disorders. And um, it, it does produce distress, functional impairment, and um, psychological, and, and impaired psychological and functional well-being. So the type of uh, worry present in generalized anxiety disorder is a frequent we all worry. Everyone here, if I say, you know, is there someone here that doesn't worry from time to time? Is there anyone here who may not worry ever? Probably no. It's part of what we do. But in generalized anxiety disorder, the worry is intense, it's frequent, and it's um, focused among a different kind of uh, topics. And of course, the person who suffers from excessive worry is, uh, or at least feels, unable to control that worry. Uh, I'm presenting information of Australia because this is where I come from. And uh, in Australia, the 12-month prevalence of generalized anxiety disorder, uh, it's 2.7%. So it's very common. And uh, clinical psychology uh, is one of the most common things we, we treat. Intolerance of uncertainty has been widely studied. It's nothing new that when people feel that uh, they cannot predict the future, they feel anxious. Intolerance of uncertainty has been implicated in uh, excessive worry. And there have been many, many studies confirming that. And this study also provides further uh, validation of that. But it, uh, the particular thing we wanted to investigate in this uh, research is above and beyond intolerance of uncertainty if we could find uh, links between attachment and in particular insecure attachment. Uh, and attachment disorders are an area of my um, interest and so in this study we have combined um, attachment style, excessive worry and intolerance of uncertainty. As I said before, in generalized anxiety, we have interpersonal conflict, 
we find that that interpersonal conflict, particularly in uh, close relationships, may be originated by the existence of problematic parent and child relationships, interpersonal loss and trauma. Uh, high levels of anxiety are also common in interpersonal disorders. There is some preliminary evidence that uh, an anxious attachment is related to a different response, treatment response to um, generalized anxiety disorders. And it's not surprising, really. If you know the literature on um, generalized anxiety disorder and the treatments we use, cognitive behavior therapy being the treatment of choice, um, even in cognitive behavior therapy, we need to develop a good relationship between the therapist and a, um, the patient. And if a patient has an avoidant uh, personality style, it would be very difficult to get that person to treat the anxiety if we cannot develop a relationship between the client and the therapist. So what we were trying to do, uh, the aim of this second study, was to look at the re explore the relationship between intolerance of un uncertainty, adult attachment-related interpersonal styles, and worry, by controlling for depressive symptoms, and we divided the sample into high worry warriors and low warriors, and. Um, and the reason for this is that we didn't interview our um, participants. It was an online survey, and um, it, it was to do with the design of the uh, online survey. Uh, we had a very good response rate, and um, the final sample was composed of almost 400 participants, all psychology students. Um, and um, as you know, the majority of psychology students, at least in Australia, are women. And um, they were aged from 18 to uh, 58 years old. Um, mature students, I would say. These are the, the questionnaires that we use and participants completed. The Penn State Worry Questionnaire is a very well validated, commonly used questionnaire. And we use a very conservative a cutoff point uh, of 62 to divide the sample into high and low warriors. We use the depression, anxiety, and stress um, scale. We use a questionnaire uh, called Revised Adult Attachment Scale. And we divide it. Uh, according to the questionnaire, um, there are scales of anxious attachment and avoidant attachment. And um, anxious attachment it is, um, refers to the extent in which the person um, is worried, concerned about being unloved, abandoned, and uh, rejected. The avoidant personality style, it's more to do with feeling uncomfortable when close to another person, and it, it, it includes a variety of um, relationships, not just intimate relationships, but friendships. Um, and a, a problem with trust. Of course, when you think that people are not going to be there when you need them, uh, it, it won't be surprising that you don't trust people being there to help you when, um, when necessary. And we use the intolerance of uncertainty scale. So using that cutoff, we divided the sample. And uh, the uh, low worry group was composed of 232 women, 75 males, similar um, median age. The high worry group, which is, as you can tell, it's probably a quarter of uh, a sample. Uh, most females, 
younger in, on average. And this is something that we validated and confirmed from the first study, that our young, younger students were more anxious and more worried about different um, issues. Because we had a substantial number of participants, we could do uh, stepwise um, multiple uh, hierarchical uh, multiple regression. And um, I'm going to pr first present the total sample, the results for the total sample, and then I'd like to present with the differences between the contrast between the two groups. Uh, first of all, we control for depressive symptoms on uh, step one. Then on step two, we control for the attachment variables that I mentioned before. And in step three, we control for uh, intolerance of uncertainty. What we found that following those uh, steps in the, in the re regression, we could explain the variance of worry, which was our um, um, outcome variable, um, in the group for uh, low worry, 32, almost 33%, and a good proportion of the variance of high worry was also explained by the model, the initial model. Uh, therefore, in step one, and for those who are interested in stats, I've got that separately. But I didn't want to uh, bore you to death with numbers and percentages. So, but let me know if you're interested in the, the stats. Um, on step one, what we found was that the higher the depressive symptoms, the higher the worry in both groups. When we introduced the second variable, attachment style, we found that the higher the depressive symptoms, the higher the worry, and the higher the, higher the anxious interpersonal style. And when we introduced step three, we basically found that um, the higher the intolerance of uncertainty, the, the more what ifs questions that I mentioned before, the higher the worry. There's nothing too surprising or new about this because this is all according to our hypothesis. Now, in the low worry subsample, we found that, um, and for the light, I think. In, I don't know how to point to worry. Here. Um, so the variation of worry was explained by depressive symptoms, as I said, intolerance of anxiety, and through the mediation of the uh, attachment styles. And because um, my job involves training clinical psychologists were mostly interested in the other subsample, the ones that are clinically uh, significant to us, more than statistical significant, because today I'd like to talk to you about the clinical implications of, of this. So this is what i like to uh, note. There was a tendency, there was a trend that we found um, where anxious and avoidant attachment styles were beginning to produce a statistic significance, but not that strong. And the reason for that is that the sample wasn't, um, we didn't have enough power to demonstrate, and I'm going to discuss it a little bit more in results. Now, this is the way we interpreted the results and uh, with some limitations that we have in this study. As we expected, intolerance of uncertainty shows a strong relationship, quite strong relationship uh, with worry, 
over and above all the other variables in both groups. When we talk about the low worry subsample, depressive symptoms and anxious interpersonal style contributed to the variation in worry through the mediation of intolerance of uncertainty. However, here is you know, the part that we find that we didn't have uh, enough power to um, demonstrate the, the strength of the relationship. Uh, in this subsample, depressive symptoms largely contributed to the variation of worry indirectly through its relationship with intolerance of uncertainty. But we couldn't, we can't say that for sure. It's only a tendency. There's a trend, particularly in those individuals. Remember, there were the two groups the ones that were avoidant and the ones that were anxious. In this particular group, the higher the avoidance, the lower the worry. And it makes sense from a clinical perspective because why would you be so worried about things if you cannot connect with people? So uh, the ones that are more preoccupied about relationships were the ones that were more worried because they are uh, really immersed and preoccupied with relationships. Um, there is a trend that I mentioned before for the full model and in the, step, uh, in the uh, different steps. Okay, finally. <laughs> Um, these are um, some of the implications for us, mental health professionals. Those individuals that may become to therapy and they may not have generalized anxiety disorder, but they may have a quite excessive um, element or component of worry, it is important to reduce that level of worry, targeting intolerance of anxiety, of uncertainty, um, and to enhance the to pay attention to depressive symptoms, because they usually we find this comorbidity between anxiety and depression. It may at times we may concentrate on worry and anxiety and somehow uh, neglect depressive symptoms, but as shown in this study, they coexist. And uh, most importantly for this group, the high worry, individuals who are likely to have a full-blown um, generalized anxiety disorder, then it is important again to reduce that excessive uh, worry um, targeting intolerance of uncertainty, but at the same time targeting depressive symptoms. Otherwise, we may find that the regular treatments for generalized anxiety disorder may not be that efficacious. We believe that some of the strengths in this study are things like we examine a relationship from a vantage point of insecure attachment. Uh, we believe that um, we confirm, we provided further evidence of uh, the robust interaction between worry and anxiety and intolerance of uncertainty. And um, we highlighted the importance of addressing comorbidity factors. Some of the limitations, we used a sample of students and, um, and it's not a sample that we can consider as a clinical sample. Uh, we suspect that those in the high anxiety group would probably have uh, generalized anxiety disorder, but we didn't interview them and we didn't, it was, I mean, most of the questionnaires we used were self-referred um, questionnaires. So we cannot, of course, 
conclude that there's any um, causal effects or explanation of the relationships, but we know that they interact together. And even though this was a big sample, it was in not big enough to, uh, to conduct some more studies. So in future conferences, I should be able to present um, new studies that we are currently conducting where we are learning from the limitations of the study and trying to uh, address those limitations. And um, we like, in, you know, our future studies would like to um, investigate that trend that this particular study showed and uh, replicate uh, the study with the clinical population. And at the moment, I'm working with another university in Sydney, Australia, and um, in another uh, university I work uh, previously, and uh, we're going to use a sample, f they are going to provide the, compa the clinical comparison. And this is all from me, so I'm looking forward to some questions. References? Uh, actually, hello. Uh, Dr. Lirakos, the chair of this, couldn't be with us today oh. as uh, Dr. Um, the chairperson. Yeah, the chair yeah. Yeah, announced. So um, what uh, we would like, if you want, you can take the questions now. OK. OK. Thank I you. think that they have it uh, more fresh, so you can go ahead. Uh, Thank you. Or if you want, you can come sit next to me and whatever okay. you want. I think from there it's much easier. Yes. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, as I often do, because it's uh, not my primary uh, field of investigation, but if you um, measure these different uh, traits or dimensions that you are interested mm. in and you find the correlations. Um, is there a way to control whether or not that the connections that you find uh, could be also based because of the items uh, that overlap in their descriptions? Because I yes. presume that like worry and depressive symptoms, they share um, the basis. So is there a way to control for this? And did you uh, in this particular uh, study? Or? Well, we did control for, uh, for those variables. Um, in when you do a correlation, uh, I mean, a correlation is only a descriptive stats. That's why we did um, multiple regression. So we tried to predict uh, how moving uh, an increment in these variables would correlate with an increment or a uh, decrease in other variables. There isn't um, a perfect way to do this. And, uh, but normally what we find is that after doing the, the, um, the study, when you do the, the, the analysis, if uh, two variables are correlated closer to one, it means that <laughs> they're the same. So, I mean, there's statistical uh, ways to control for these variables. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that was an excellent presentation, and the methodology was so sound. Thank you. Um, I just would like to ask you, why is it that how would you explain this thing? Like, why is it that uh, people who worry less, they experience higher worry when uh, they have anxious interpersonal style? Why is it that? Remember that I'm going to, can I go back to the, to the presentation? Yes, to the presentation. Uh, not sure. Oh, here, here. Before. So yes, this may explain. Um, this questionnaire we use divided 
the two different scales, anxious attachment and avoidant attachment. Yes. And that result was only um, relevant to this group, the avoidant subscale. In general, anxious attachment involves or predicts high anxiety and high worry. But it didn't in only in this sub subgroup. And we believe the reason for that, contrary to our expectation, I mean, we had to think a lot about this. Your question is so um, relevant to us because we thought, oh, that's strange. Why is it that it doesn't follow the same trend? And we believe that the um, avoidant individual, it's not, or at least in this particular study, didn't show high worry, not because they don't, um, it's, it's more about the expression of that anxiety and worry, um, and because they have a quite dismissive style. So they don't need others. They also, it's the same basis. It's people are not there for me. And therefore, I learn to be on my own. I don't need anyone. It's a defensive style. But in general, it's an anxious style. It's a subcategory of an anxious style. It's like the other, the, the, the opposite. There's a preoccupied style, and there is the avoidant style. Both of them we call anxious attachment styles. Right. And remember, these were um, self-reported questionnaires. Uh, in previous research I've, I conducted, I use interview-based questionnaires that are much more sophisticated to measure attachment style. Well, thank you. Thank you. Did I answer your question? You did, you did. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you something? Uh, yes to her question. Uh, so the further um, research that you will do with the University of uh, Australia, you said, yes. it will be on this um, continuation like to, of yes, this? Yes, yes, yeah. Because this is very interesting. If That's can, right. Yes. Uh, because we want to compare a general uh, non-clinical sample yeah. with a clinical sample. Mm -hmm. So all of, all of the participants in the clinical sample would be people with an anxiety disorder of some kind, probably generalized anxiety disorder, mm -hmm. and see what happens. We don't know what will happen, okay. but that's the nature of research. Okay. <laughs> and the, the, uh, you were collaborating with uh, the university in Australia? Another that? university, yes. 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 Okay. That's very interesting, actually. We yes, would love but you have to wait year, and see. <laughs> next year, probably at the next uh, conference, we might. Uh, oh, you, you do this conference every, every year? year? Every ah, year, yes. Oh, okay. So that will be exciting. I'll be delighted to. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Any more questions? Or. Um, comments? Comments, <laughs> yes. Thoughts that can help our. Dr. German for her research. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, actually. Okay, well, thank you very much thank for you. your attention. Thank you thank very you. much.